Hello everyone and welcome to this demonstration of the spinal cord. On this first slide, we're looking at a dissected image from a posterior view of the brain and spinal cord. Notice how the spinal cord continues caudally from the medulla. It's essentially the terminal part of the hindbrain, myelencephalon, and extends down through the vertebral canal after passing the foramen magnum. In simple terms, once the medulla exits the skull, it enters the vertebral column and is then referred to as the spinal cord. This structure is nestled safely within the vertebral canal, providing both protection and a pathway for various nerve roots. On this slide, we see a sagittal section of the brain and spinal cord. It highlights the position of the spinal cord occupying the upper two-thirds of the vertebral canal. Here's what we need to remember. In adults, the spinal cord typically starts at the upper border of C1 and goes down to the lower border of L1. At birth, birth, it extends a bit lower, down to the lower border of L3. By about two years of age, it ascends to end at L1, where it remains for the rest of adult life. This difference at birth is mainly because the spinal column grows faster than the cord itself, causing the cord to shift higher over time. Now we have an anterior ventral view of the central nervous system. The cerebrum, cerebellum, pons, medulla, and the spinal cord are clearly visible. In this dissected view, the meninges that surround the spinal cord have been removed in sections exposing the nerve rootlets. These rootlets eventually combine to form the spinal nerves on each side. If you look toward the lower end, you'll see a bunch of nerve roots forming what's known as the cauda equina, which literally means horse's tail due to its appearance. Here we see details on the length and diameter of the spinal cord. It's about 40 to 50 centimeters long with a diameter ranging from about one centimeter to 1.5 centimeters. Along each side, two continuous rows of nerve roots emerge, which join distally to form 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Towards the inferior end, the spinal cord tapers off into a cone-shaped structure called the conus medullaris. From the tip of this conus, a thin filament known as the filum terminal stretches down to the first coccygeal vertebra, anchoring the cord in place. The cauda equina is simply a bundle of lower spinal nerve roots, L2 to L5, S1 to S5, coccygeal vertebra, that traverse downward within the vertebral canal before exiting at their respective vertebral levels. It's named for its resemblance to a horse's tail. Next, we focus on the dura mater. This tough outermost meningeal covering extends all the way from the foramen magnum down to about the level of S2 in the vertebral column. Beyond S2, it becomes thinner and blends with surrounding tissues until it finally anchors onto the dorsal surface of the coccyx. This ensures the spinal cord and its coverings remain stable within the spinal canal. Here we explore the spaces around the meningeal layers. Epidural space. This lies between the inner surface of the vertebral canal and the dura mater. It's filled with fat and small blood vessels, helping cushion and protect the cord. It's sealed above where the dura merges with the foramen magnum and below at the sacrococcygeal ligament near the sacral hiatus. Subdural space. This potential space sits between the dura mater and the arachnoid matter, and it extends to the lower border of S2. Now let's talk about the arachnoid matter and pia mater. Arachnoid matter, a thin, avascular membrane continuing from the brain's arachnoid layer down to about S2. Pia mater, a thin, highly vascular membrane that clings tightly to the spinal cord surface. Beyond the cord's lower end, it continues as the filum terminal, 
We also have special pia mater processes. Ligamentum denticulatum, denticulate ligament. These are tooth-like, ribbon-like projections of pia that anchor the cord laterally by attaching to the inner surface of the dura. There are around 21 such pairs, starting at the foramen magnum and extending down to about T12 to L1. They help stabilize the cord within the subarachnoid space and are landmarks for surgeons performing chordotomies. Subarachnoid space, the space between arachnoid and pia mater, it contains cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, blood vessels, and tiny connective tissue filaments called arachnoid trabeculae. This CSF is vital for cushioning the spinal cord. Continuing with the phylum terminal, it's a thin, glistening white thread that extends from the conus medullaris down to the first coccygeal vertebra, CO1. It has two parts, phylum terminal internum, about 15 centimeters long, located inside the dural sac, phylum terminal externum, about five centimeters long, once it emerges outside the dural sac to finally anchor onto the coccyx. This phylum terminal helps keep the spinal cord from moving excessively within the vertebral canal. When we look at the spinal cord in cross section, we can distinguish gray matter in the center and white matter on the outside. Gray matter, shaped like an H or a butterfly, and contains the cell bodies, dendrites, and proximal axons of neurons. It's divided into anterior, ventral horns, posterior, dorsal horns, and in some regions, lateral horns, T1 to L2. These horns are connected across the midline by the gray commissure, which surrounds the central canal. White matter, found around the periphery and anterior, lateral, and posterior columns. Its white appearance comes from myelin, which insulates ascending and descending axons. These axons form tracks carrying signals to and from different parts of the body. Finally, let's look at how the spinal cord's appearance changes at different levels. Cervical level. Large and somewhat oval cross-section with a high volume of white matter and well-developed gray matter in the anterior horns to serve the upper limbs. Thoracic level, typically smaller and more circular. You'll see lateral horns in T1 to L2 segments and relatively slender anterior and posterior horns. Lumbar level, more circular with bulky gray matter especially in the anterior and posterior horns that supply the lower limbs. Sacral level has the least white matter but more prominent, rounded anterior and posterior horns. As we travel up the cord, more ascending fibers join, increasing the amount of white matter while descending fibers branch off at each segment, reducing their overall count farther down. Meanwhile, the gray matter size at each level correlates with the amount of muscle mass and sensory innervation that region serves, hence the enlargements in the cervical and lumbar areas. Thank you for joining this detailed lecture of the spinal cord. I hope it helps you visualize and understand each aspect, from its protective layers and anchored structures to the internal organization of gray and white matter. Keep revisiting these slides for a solid grasp of spinal cord anatomy, and I'll see you in the next session.